Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Todd and Shane's Cloudy Podcast, episode 418, recorded live Wednesday, January 16th, 2019. Those of you that are on the video screen and enjoy uh, my complete and total lack of a haircut will also notice that it's not Shane joining me this week. Instead, it's Mark. Oh, I pointed the wrong way. It's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, introduce yourself to the listeners and the viewers. Hey, it's Mark Anderson. Uh, I, I like to think of myself as a friend of Shane and Todd's. But yeah, yeah. I yeah, like you more than I like Shane, so yeah. Sort of comes and goes, you yeah. know. Yeah, so Shane is out gallivanting across Florida, uh, spreading the good word about flow and power apps and who knows what else. So uh, I asked Mark to step in for me, and he graciously agreed to do that. So I, I appreciate you coming on board. Well, you know how we are at Simpraxis. Most of the time, we're just sitting around on our thumbs. So, you know, when something like this comes up. You, usually, yeah, we're, we're in teams trying to figure out how to use teams so that we can mm -hmm. send each other jokes back and forth. And yep. uh Man, it, and so uh, so it's funny. So I'm I'm the only uh, Simpraxian or Simpraxite or whatever the the demonym is for us that is in the Central Time Zone. So I'm an hour behind all of the other folks. And this morning, like right after eight, you guys had your coffee. You guys started chatting in Teams. I was still laying in bed, and my phone. I have Teams um, not set to do any kind of alerting uh, on my phone. But my watch gets alert. So every time the, the silent alert would show up, my watch would vibrate. But my watch wasn't in the room. My watch was in the bathroom where my wife was. And she's like, what the hell is going on? Your, your watch is freaking out. And I had no idea because I wasn't looking at my phone. And I'm like, oh, those crazy East Coasters chatting. Well, and, Ju and Julie's in her own time zone because she's up at like 5 in the morning. So, you know, it's, like she, it's almost like she's in Europe. <laughs> Our, our European <laughs> office right there in, in New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, so that was uh, that was fun stuff. So, Mark, one of the things that Shane and I noticed far, far too late is that our episode numbers match up with HTTP codes. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. so we've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, last week's uh, HTTP code appropriately was expectation failed, which I think ought to be the name of this podcast. If I had yeah, to rename that's it. Actually, yeah, that's sort of fitting, isn't failed it? Failed expectations. But so I, I think. I think this week's is a little better. I, I like this week's, and it was funny. So go ahead and tell them what HTTP code 418 is. Well, it's your show, dude. You, I, I, you can go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. HTTP 418 is, of course, I'm a teapot. Of course. How? Because how, everyone was going to guess that. Right. right. How could we run web servers and web <laughs> clients and have them have any sort of communication without them being able to communicate succinctly? I'm right. a teapot. Yes. That, uh, of, absolutely. Course, of course, the important thing about the I'm a teapot message is that it, it actually lets you know that the server refuses to brew coffee because it's a teapot. teapot. Right. That's, right. Yeah, so that's, if you ask that server for coffee, you're going to get a 418 back. Yeah. Yeah. That's And so the funny thing about that particular quote, uh, other than the code itself is funny in and of itself. Um, I had, we were trying to get the audio and the video set up beforehand. And I'm Mark and I are on Skype, so we can hear each other, but the crowd can't hear us. The chat room can't hear us. And so I tell Mark, hey, uh, while I'm trying to figure this out, go look and look up HTTP code 418. So I'm clicking the things, and, and Mark says to me, I'm a teapot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you know, I'll, I'll play along, Mark. Are you short? Are you stout? <laughs> and we're, it's like an episode of Three's Company. We're okay, talking about I didn't understand what you were saying. You didn't understand what I was saying. So it's pretty much a par for the course kind of thing, really. It was, uh, yeah, it was awesome. So that that's great fun with the uh, uh, 418 HTTP. That's that's awesome. And I remember back in the day seeing things like the webcams on the coffee pots, and so I, I think that probably comes out of that. But that uh, that was fun. That's it's been around since uh, 1998. Yeah. So. so I was on the internet in '98. That was yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's good stuff. So that's that maybe 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 that'll be this week's episode title. I'm a teapot. <laughs> um, so for production notes, everything's going smooth. I got last week's out early, and we have to talk to say nice things about the the folks at Syskit because they are friends of ours. I do some work for them. I help them with products and marketing and all that. I just got an email from them a couple of days ago. We're starting off. We've got some big plans for what they're going to do product wise this year. So. Keep an eye out on that. I'll probably be blogging some of that. I'm going to be writing some stuff for their blog. And it's, uh, it's and they're just easier. small folks. They are the best. So I, I got to go hang out with them last month in Croatia. And that was something they had been asking me to do, to come over and spend a couple of days with them and help them with some product uh, design and things like that. And I, they started asking like in June or July of last year. And I kept being busy and kept putting it off. Didn't get over until December. 
And man, was I kicking myself because that was a, they got a great office and they're great people and Zagreb's a great city. And I'm like, why did I not do this six months ago? So, I miss Zagreb. Yeah. When they moved the conference from Zagreb up to Germany, I mean, Germany's cool, yeah, but yeah. I like going to Zagreb. Yeah, and I was there in Zagreb during Christmas. So I was there like the first weekend of December. And they do this thing where essentially the entire old city part of Zagreb becomes a big Christmas fair. And it was, uh, I mean, like, they didn't have to do all that for me. I, I'm still, I'm a nobody, but they really decked the town well, out. They only, really... only, this was the only year that that actually happened, I think. And I, yeah. and I, and I Todd's appreciate coming. it. Todd's coming. Todd's coming. Quick, everybody, hang up a million lights and have 10,000 food vendors. If, if anyone could, you know, let us know how we say Todd's coming in Croatian, I think that would be a bonus. Yeah. So I, I haven't told you the story. I think I told it on the podcast after I got back, but... Zagreb's a big city. I don't know how big, uh, but I mean, it's hundreds of thousands big of people. Yeah, Definitely. big. And so Tony Francola was taking me around on a Friday night to this big thing. And this thing, it's in the entire old city. I mean, it is massive, the, 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 the length and breadth of this thing. And we kept running into friends of his <laughs> everywhere. Like, it, this happened like 10 times. I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. One of the times we ran into friends of his was one of them was a buddy of his from college and his wife and their son, and their son's like five. So the buddy and his wife were chatting with the kid in Croatian. Tony sees him. He walks over, says some stuff in Croatian, introduces me in Croatian. Then they switch to English so that I can understand what they're saying. As soon as they switch to English, the five-year-old kid starts getting mad because now he can't understand it. And so he asks the dad, why are you speaking in this devil tongue? Why are you not speaking in Croatian? And the dad says to the kid, well, Tony's friend here doesn't speak Croatian. And so we switched to English so he can understand. And the kid has never met anybody that doesn't speak Croatian. Like he can't. And so the rest of the night as he followed us around, he kept trying to trick me into talking to him in Croatian. Because <laughs> it just was so crazy to him that any adult who could like tie his shoes and feed himself couldn't speak Croatian. Was... What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> it's like he thought i was a little slow can't even speak croatian so so when you got back did you try to you know teach owen some croatian so that you know when th this wouldn't happen to him <laughs> no I'm, I'm still trying to teach him to not stand on the table and not to you know, <laughs> trucks well, his sister you, and... you, know, you you may well have croatians come and visit you in iowa that could happen anytime because yeah. Yeah. you know croatians love iowa they do and there's a lot to love but they all speak english so it will uh True. Yeah, true. Was, oh, so that that whole uh, never mind that all falls down. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was that little kid, and he had the same. He was same age as Owen, same general five year old little boy energy and lack of respect for authority. And it was it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> fascination uh, with authority. Mm -hmm. uh, so on to the topic. So the first thing. This is the final week of the birthday charity drive. Those of you that have been listening to the podcast, it all in the last ten years know all about this. The month between Lori's birthday and I, my birthday, we have a charity drive. We don't ask you to give to us. We don't even ask you to give to our charities of choice. We don't, we don't even care. All we ask is that if you've got a little left over, think about giving it to a charity of your choice, whatever's important to you, and then come brag to Lori and I about how generous you are. Just talk yourself up a little bit. Tell us what a great person you are. And then at the end of the month, we'll tally up the, the amount of all the, the charity that's been given out, uh, we'll clap for ourselves, pat each other on the back. And in previous years, I have uh, agreed to match whatever charitable donations the viewers have done. Then they started getting into the thousands of dollars, and I sort of uh, ratcheted that back for a couple of years. Yes, so Brett in the chat room has the hashtag uh, bankrupt Todd for charity. I think that is a, a noble thing. Excellent. And so Excellent. this year, before the numbers got where they are at, I talked to the lovely Mrs. Clint, and we agreed that we will, we will match the funds again this year. And at last count, Lori updated it right before the podcast. We're a little over $5,000, so $5,200, something like that. So kudos to all of you out there. You've got like three days or so to get those in, and I'll talk about uh, about that next week. What, what kind of charity, what, what charities do you hear people donating to, or do you not ask that question? Well, well I, I, I don't ask. So Lori, so this was Lori and Dan Usher's idea 10 years ago, and Lori has kept the torch going on that. Uh, so she asks that question. There's a website you can go to LoriGowan.com and, and click in there, and it's in there, and it's all kinds of great stuff. Uh, St. Jude's and various, you know, uh, medical things, cancer funds, and Red Cross, and it's all it's all out there. It's it's amazing stuff. And I guess one of the things 
about charities is we all have our pet things and you know so I've, I've got four or five charities that my wife and I give to every year and we just kind of you, you get blinders so it is interesting to see what other things are out there I'm like oh yeah that's a pretty worthy cause too. so so can I I give a, a bunch of money to charity at the end of the year and I, you know I, I could claim that and help bankrupt you if it happened between December 19th and oh, you, you could be in trouble here yeah <laughs> <laughs> what what you know what if it was like I don't know say the 40th anniversary of my graduating from high school and so I gave them a whole bunch of money I would hope that's not the case <laughs> <laughs> I could end up regretting it because <laughs> it actually is but you know because it actually is and I actually did <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll uh, I'll be discreet about this I, yes um, so no it's great and then what and Lori also has people she gets a birthday card and they all sign it so I've got a stack of birthday cards I still got the last couple on my desk here uh, the people who did it signed it and put with their their that's sure, really sure. cool. I didn't. I didn't know you guys did this. We've and done it, every year since the first year of the podcast. Yeah. And luckily, it's it's on SharePoint 2010, so we know it's it's reliable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've been doing this for ten years, and ironically, it's on the exact same platform today <laughs> that it was the first day that we launched. It. Hey, it worked then. It works <laughs> now, right? I mean, it broke. Don't fix it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, that's totally. Awesome. Yeah, and the thing about that, so that was not my idea. So we started the podcast in March of 2019 or 2009, and then that uh, that December, that was all Lori and Dan's idea. They were all like, "Hey, you know, you." Uh, and then that was one of the things. Um, and I didn't do, I don't do it much now, but but if you remember 2009, kind of a rough time, and so early in the podcast, I was like, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of people that are needing some help right now, and if you have the opportunity to help some folks." Now's a good time to do it because there's a lot of people out there that can benefit yeah. from that. And so then when my birthday came around, they're like, hey, let's let's make this official. Let's put pen to paper. Let's ask people to do this. And uh, no, that was great. I, so Dan and Lori get all the credit for it. It was a great idea. <laughs> uh, Mark is asking in the chat room, uh, yes, but didn't you have to rebuild the farm once or twice? I think, Mark, in the time that I have hosted my blog and Lori's thing right now on SharePoint 2010, Without exaggeration, I have probably had to rebuild that seven or eight times uh, from different moving hosting providers or hosting providers deleting my stuff or it just, you know, patching it to death. Um, yeah, so it's been quite a few. One of the things that Mark and Lori always yell at me about, and I'm honestly a little surprised that Mark hasn't brought it up yet, is to move my blog to WordPress, which apparently no, is, I, a, is an okay blogging I, I platform. Was, I wasn't going to, you know, I'm... I admire you for your tenacity on this one. I'm not tenacity, stupidity. There you go. Uh, but for another project I'm doing outside of work, I'm using WordPress for a couple of things, and and I've got like a list of reasons why I can't move my blog to WordPress. And as I've been playing with WordPress, I've been winnowing that list down. I've, I've started figuring some things out. So I'm not saying I'm in the process of moving my blog to WordPress, but it is more likely now than it has ever been. We'll, it, we'll it, you know, it, I, I, I don't think it's going to be that hard retyping all that stuff. You don't think so? so? I've only got yeah, like 800 and some blog posts and yeah, tens of thousands of comments. I mean, it's in your spare time, yeah. we're, we, you know, we're at some praxis. Again, I, I want to point out we're sort of a different culture. We, in, we encourage people to retype their blogs every couple of years, really. And yeah. so you haven't done it. You haven't done it in a decade. So I, I have not. No. I actually, I did, uh, so this was one, I, I don't remember if you remember this, there was uh, several years ago, call it five years ago, I had my blog hosted at a place, and I don't want to throw shade on anybody, so I won't say what it was, and they deleted my VM, like just went away. Oh. And I had been assured that, it, so I had been backing up my databases to the VM in case SharePoint or SQL crapped itself, I would have the databases locally. And then I was assured by the hosting provider that there were backups of the VM somewhere. So I thought I was covered. And then the VM went away and I went, wow, that really sucks, but it's a good thing we have those backups of the VM, right? And the person went, oh, yeah, about that. So there were no backups of my blog for seven months, something like that. And so what I ended up doing, uh, so I had I had a backup from when I moved it over there. I applied that, and then I absolutely reposted all of the blog posts that I had posted in that seven month period, and I had all of the alerts from SharePoint of the comments that people had left. I pasted those all back in as well. It took me like a month to get it back up to speed. Wow, that's dedication, man. It was 
yeah, I was, and I think it was only the the pure fury and hatred of that situation that that allowed me to power through and do. And, and somehow this is all tied up in giving money to charity and doing good in the world. So, I, I you know, again, I admire you for. Yeah. But, so, but yeah, but hopefully uh, we'll uh, we'll be able to make that go to a better platform, WordPress or something, and, and get that. To, yeah. Enough about that. I need to talk about happier things. So I, I think everybody, everybody who's watching this is is sort of sitting there going, uh, "Like, why are we here, Todd?" <laughs> this is like a therapy <laughs> session. All the things that have hurt me. that's the thing. At the end, if you feel better, then it's been a successful podcast. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, and it's for for Shane and I. Uh, it's really about whether we amuse ourselves and entertain ourselves. That's really the the, the real purpose. Um, but there have been some things that have gone on in the SharePoint world in the last week. It's been a busy week uh, looking at things. And so Mark, Shane and I travel in similar circles. He does more Power Apps and Flow, obviously, than I do. But we have a lot of the same interests. Mark is a developer, so he brings a completely different set of things in. So I thought there was a bunch of stuff for me to talk about. And then Mark I travel in hexagons. Yeah, exactly. I travel in circles. Yes. You, uh, yeah. um, so the first thing that I wanted to mention, and Mark and I both put this in the notes so you know it's important, is that Microsoft is going to be removing the ability um, to, at the tenant level, stick to the classic list and library interface. So there's a lot of nooks and crannies in that whole thing. Um, so several, I don't even remember when, several months, a year ago, whatever, Microsoft rolled out the modern lists and libraries which look different, obviously, and have different functionality, but they allowed you to set at the tenant level a setting that says everything's going to be classic. So you had some time to train your users and figure out processes and things like that. And starting April 1st, this is no joke, that tenant level switch goes away. So now if you want to keep your list and libraries at the classic level, you have to do it at the list level, kind of slowly weaning us off of those. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think people who set that switch at the tenant level probably did a couple of years ago. Yeah. Most people, I mean, if you come to SharePoint new and you do that, there's something wrong. Yeah. I'm sure there are some people doing that, but they've sort of painted themselves into a corner really, because changing that switch means that you're either going to go all modern or you've got to do something to, you know, sort of carve out your niches. The one thing that's important to note here though, Todd, mm -hmm. going to notice this, <laughs> note this, it's not going to switch any lists or libraries that have customizations that prevent them from going to modern. So there's there's stuff checked in the back, you know, like if you have, uh, and I don't know exactly what they are, but like if you customize the forms for a list, oh. that can't go to modern because you've customized the forms. So it's going to be anything that's vanilla enough to go to the modern view. Gotcha. That's good. And I was just thinking... This sounds like a job for PowerShell, like to walk through an inventory exactly. lists and libraries that have that, or if you wanted to force classic, right. PowerShell to walk through. Um, I wonder if anybody has PowerShell lying around that would do that. That sounds impossible. I can't imagine anybody's. Might be really hard. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, but, you know, and you talk about new customers. I've been noticing, you know, the last year, year and a half, most of the um, migrations that I've done have been to new SharePoint uh, users, you know, customers that are using SharePoint new and from file shares. And so for those folks, they just know modern and that's all that right. it is. And, and so, yeah, they have not uh, done that. And Drew in the chat room brought up, yeah, there is a modernization scanner. If, and Drew, if you want to throw that link in the chat room, I'll put it in the notes. There we go. Uh, so that would probably do it too. Yeah. That, that the post that Chris McNulty did, I, I think, you know, it, people are always trying to read between the lines and find some tea leaves lying around. <laughs> which is useful because, you know, as you know, I'm a teapot. So, so, you know, it, it, th this is, this is not like some big disaster and Microsoft shoving something down our, down our throats. You know, that seems to be the, like the classic response to these things. I think Chris has laid it out very clearly in that post. So you need to read all the words that he says and not panic. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a classic SharePoint guy. I've been using SharePoint forever and used to the classic lists and libraries, and I've, I've I've made peace with the modern stuff. It's not that bad. It's it's different, but it's not bad. 
but different is bad, right? Uh, it can change, be. Change is bad. It can be. Uh, it's, uh, you know, change. I, I prefer bills over change, but, you know. Um, but, yeah, the, the modern lists and libraries, I think Microsoft has done a great job making the, the, the value of them worth the pain of switching to them and training and all of that. Right. Right. Um, so I've uh, I've been I've been a big fan of it. So yeah, whenever I talk to customers, regardless of what they're migrating from, I tell them let's if, if at all possible let's just start with modern and you know that's uh, good stuff. So that's uh, that's one of them. Now one of the things that modern sites have is this idea of site scripts and site designs. And you put a couple of things in the notes about those. Would you like to tell the folks about that? Yeah. Well, and, you know, honestly, this isn't something I've spent a lot of time deciphering or figuring out, but it's the modern way to do to do, to provision or deploy uh, sites, right? You write a script that sort of uh, declaratively says, this is the stuff that I want in this site. It's relatively new functionality. It's been around, how long has it been around? Uh, a six year? months? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, not, not forever. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it, to me, it makes a lot more sense than what, what used to have to happen with features and all that weird stuff. Yes. And so uh, there's a great, um, uh, the, the ultimate guide to SharePoint site designs and site scripts from Laura Kokarinen. <laughs> I think I said that right, Kokarinen. I, yes, I, uh, she's, you know, Julie and I were talking about this this morning. She's somebody who sort of, to me, came from no, came out of nowhere and is just like writing crazy good stuff and really useful content. So if you don't know Laura, I think to me, these site scripts and stuff are, you know, right up your alley. Absolutely. They're, yeah. they're admin like stuff. Yep. Um, but they also have a they have, have sort of a developer flavor to them too. I mean, you know, they, I know you don't like to admit that writing PowerShell is coding, it's but not, yeah. <laughs> and the and the site scripts are sort of the, the same way, right? So yeah, she has a great guide. It's um it's very useful, and she's been updating it as things change. So if you are getting into this stuff, that's a great place to start. Yeah, I think so. You and I have been around long enough uh, in SharePoint to remember the days where we had site templates and site definitions, right. and for maximum confusion, the site definitions were stored in the templates directory. I mean, all this crazy, I mean, all that. Microsoft isn't good with words. Oh, goodness, yeah, I'm trying to explain that to the people. So there there've always been a whole bunch of really bad ways to customize SharePoint. And I think they've, they've finally, this is another one of those things that I chalk up to the fact that since Microsoft has to support SharePoint and host SharePoint, they're figuring a lot of these things out that guys like you and I have been screaming about for a decade. And I think the site scripts and the site designs is a great example of that. It's a great way to stamp out identical lists and libraries in a you know, reproducible way, a predictable way. And th so, so Laura's thing, that was one of the things that was blowing up the, my, my watch this morning. And I, I looked at that briefly. It looked really great, uh, really great stuff. But I, I didn't get a chance to read that um, very thoroughly. But one of the things that has always kept me from uh, rolling out site designs and site scripts on big company wide thing, because it does it matches a bunch of things that people want. But the only way you could manage it was with PowerShell. And there was no way for a site collection administrator to do anything with it without getting into PowerShell, which they totally have permission to do, but most of them are not comfortable with. So right. That kind of made this a, a no starter. But back in December, the SharePoint team blog had a thing, you know, here's some stuff that we're gonna do, here's the roadmap. And one of those things is we're going to put an interface for selecting site designs inside of the site collection. So somebody like myself can upload one or whatever and it will show up in a picker and people can pick it. And I just saw a couple days ago that that has reached the targeted release ring of SharePoint Online. So if you're in the, the targeted release, you should now have that interface. So now site collection administrators can consume these things without having to break out PowerShell. And so when I saw Laura's thing, I saw this book and I'm like, did she write this before or after that came out? And is she gonna have to keep updating this? And I actually, I know she, uh, you notice underneath the picture, she has a date uh, as a, sort of like an last updated date. And she she actually updated it today. I saw her say that on Twitter. So. Oh, excellent. So I don't know exactly where in the update scheme it is, but um, that's pretty cool. You know, for, and for me, not as a developer, but 
from a user experience information architect side, we all have all these hats in the closet, right? Yeah. If if I can if I can roll out an information architecture using site scripts, then that makes me very happy, right? I mean, I'm, I'm very big on using content types and site columns and all that sort of stuff, and I believe, and, and again, this is where I need to I need to get more familiar with this stuff by rolling things out with the same GUIDs and all that sort of thing. You 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 get the glue that makes your uh, your information architecture work well. Yeah as opposed to using the content type hub. Which was a great idea, and then it's like it's frozen in time. It's yeah. Like, it's like Peter Pan. It will never age. It will always right. look exactly the same. <laughs> well, and it's got a UI. So, you know, from that perspective, it's great for, for those end users who need to define information architecture and then publish it out. But it, yeah. it just doesn't work that well, it, it, you know, especially as we're moving from the, you know, the pyramids to the flat stuff. Yeah. Yep. So, so I, I know I've got to dig into this. It sounds like you and I should do that yeah. at the same time, maybe. Yeah, and in the chat room, uh, Drew Madelung and uh, Kyle have both uh, posted some tools to help design the site designs. So I'm going to put those in the show notes. If you're listening to the podcast, you can go to toddclint.com slash podcast 418, and there'll be links to all the stuff that we're talking about. So you can, uh, I, I don't need you swerving in traffic trying to write this stuff down as you're listening to the podcast. So just go out there to my blog and get those notes there. So yeah, you and I come from that thing from two totally different angles. You know, I'm, I'm relying on folks like you to, to make these site designs and add columns and add metadata and do the thing. And then it's up to me to try to figure out a way to push that out so it's you know, reproducible and doesn't kill the server and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'd be curious for us to sit down and, and revisit all that and see. Yeah. You know, because we, we've got a couple of uh, customers in the pipeline here that are going to be doing new things and right. new installations, so it would be good for us to get up to speed on that and be able to give them Well, and, and, and the, the, the other part of that whole sort of cycle is, you know, somebody like me goes in and, and does stuff through the UI, and then we want to take that and turn it into a site design, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's probably where I'd say, hey, Todd, <laughs> yes. help me, help me. Yeah, yeah I'm doing a, a PowerShell talk this afternoon at a user group so one of the one of the, the listeners eric has the fox valley sharepoint user group up in wisconsin and i'm doing a, a talk for them this afternoon and it's on powershell and i've adopted julie's philosophy on uh, presentations you know conference presentations i've got a folder that is a topic and then i pull out the slides that i need for the thing and i've noted i've got two slide decks in the powershell one one is just powershell for office 365 but I also have one that's PowerShell for Site Collection Administrators. And that deck has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger because of some of these kind of things. You know, what, you know, I've got a, a Site Collection Administrator who's done a thing and crafted a thing and they want to reproduce it. How can they make a site design out of that? How can they do whatever? And that's becoming a, um, uh, an option for them now. So that, that deck is getting bigger and getting more slides, pulling more slides out of that. So Cool. So, so that, and that was a little bit of a dig at me where I store my slides based on event as opposed to topic well and i do this i did the same thing i i had done it by event and yeah. uh so you and i were in the same camp and i, I so there's there's and as one. usual julie had the better idea <laughs> I, I think she might have so so the for for guys like mark and i we do the same talks or versions of the same talk over many years so like the powershell with office 365 when i've done that a couple of dozen times over the last three or four years and so when I get asked to do it, obviously I have to go open that deck up and change all the things that have been improved and all that. But then I have to mentally keep track of the last time I did that so that I can go to that event right. and then pull it out. And all. And I, I'd, I'd mostly done a good job with that, but, you know, things for. So Mark and I were talking about that in Teams uh, a couple of months ago, and Julie's like, well, you guys are idiots. And we're like, well, yeah, I mean, whatever. As she is, as she is wanting to. <laughs> it, It's Thursday, of course. Yeah, whatever. And she told us the way she does it is she does it by topics. And then as she's asked to do a presentation, she goes and updates that topic. And then when the topic's updated, she pulls the slides out she needs for that presentation. But whenever she starts a new one, she always goes back to the topics folder. And I'm like, right. huh. I'll be damned. That's that's not a bad idea. So I started that a couple of months ago, and it's uh, it's working out. It's I, I like the the concept, so I'm trying that out. Uh, but the PowerShell so one has been a little organizational tip there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, success. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, so there's, there's all the kind of stuff and, and Lori put the notes in for the designer, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, so if you've been thinking about trying the site designs, make sure your, your tent is in targeted release or have a you know development tenant or something and play with that and see if that's something that uh, that's good. So Definitely you, where yeah. things are going, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in a much better way than we've ever had to do this. Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah. Uh, you added some crazy developer stuff at the end that I don't understand <laughs> any bit but of. You, you, you skipped one, um, the Office 365 CLI. Well, that's, yeah, that's the next one. Yep. So just so jump into uh, that one. Uh, it's, but it's not under my crazy good oh, that's, dev that's, stuff, that's, right? That's true. That's true. Oh. <laughs> Um, I think I, when I was on the podcast the last time I brought this up, because I think, I think it's, to me, it's an alternative to PowerShell in a sense, yeah. right? Yeah. To, it's a, a platform independent way to interact with the APIs, basically, mm -hmm. that I would interact with as a developer to get stuff done with Office 365. So I think it's, it's, a, it's worth taking a look. You can, you can build yourself repeatable code there. And it, it keeps coming out. Waldeck uh, Mastercars is the the leader of that. I don't yeah. think he likes to take credit, but I think he does most of the work. He's the name that I associate with it. I mean, he's always the guy putting yeah, stuff out. Absolutely. He, 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 pretty much most of the stuff that's good that's going on in the world, he's got something to do with. Got his, got his little fingers in there. Yeah. Anyway, there's a new release, so the the, the links there in the in the uh, notes, and um, there's some new functionality. You know, it keeps coming out with new stuff. He's, you know, the surface area gets bigger and bigger, so there's a lot you can do with it. Um, and I use it. I use it as a developer when I want to do things like upgrade my SharePoint framework uh, projects because it helps you with that. So lots and lots of good stuff in there. Worth it. Worth checking out. Yeah, and I think so. The interesting thing about it is it's uh, it's it's a cross platformy thing, and that is just uh, I mean I I PowerShell a lot. PowerShell is now open source, so so PowerShell you can run on different devices, not just Windows anymore. But then your modules have to support it. So honestly, I just stick with Windows for everything. Yeah. But one of the great things about the Office CLI is now you don't need a Windows box to do Office three sixty five command line -y things. Not right. not a problem for me because I got Windows boxes coming out of my ears, but now you know, like I've got I got a stack of Raspberry Pis here. I could install this on a Raspberry Pi, and you know, or any kind of cloud environment that you've got, any sort of ephemeral, you know, hosted Linux thing that all works. Box or something. Yeah, uh, and so I, I like that. It, it's a good thing as a as a administrator. The better command line tools that are out there, just the better my job is, and so I'm. Yeah. I, I, I know that neither one of us has tried to do this, but if you took PowerShell and, and the Office 365 CLI and sort of, where are my hands, and compared them, there, you know, they might be do some, it, it might do some things that PowerShell doesn't or vice versa. So Yeah, yeah, and, and then that's one of the things. So when, when I think of that, I'm with you. I think of Waldeck being the, you know, the guy that does that. And I just imagine, and this is, I wish I was this person, but, you know, Waldeck's got a, a list of things that he wants to do. And he writes the tool to do it instead of just using it himself. After he writes the tool to do it, he publishes it in the Office 365 CLI. So, so those tools both grow in the direction of what the people who write them want to do, and so they yeah they get little different corners. He gets a lot of contributions from you know it's it's open source, so yeah. he's, he's contributions from all kinds of people. Yep. So we should give we should give them credit too. Yep. Yeah. All and, those I, I can't remember where I saw this, but it was a thing. You know, if, if somebody would have said 30 years ago. I've got this great business idea. We're going to get all the smartest people that are experts in all these fields, and we're going to get them to work on our project for free in their free time. <laughs> I mean, if anybody would have said that out loud, they're like, "Are you crazy?" But look at Linux and all these other open source things, and that's really the way it is. And and you know, if you look at what's going on just in P and P in general, which leads well into my crazy good dev stuff list. You know, they're, they're, the, the code that's coming out from people like Waldeck and, and Irwin and, you know, VESA runs that BNP effort, it's phenomenal. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's taking me forward leaps and bounds in the stuff that I build. And I'm not sure a lot of people know it's out there. So, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it's useful from an admin perspective. If you know people are using these uh, open source libraries that are, backed by Microsoft yeah. as opposed to necessarily developed by Microsoft, then at least you know that they're using something that's sort of in the in the nice part of the gray zone, right? Yeah. 
Well, and that's that's one of the things. So I've got this PowerShell thing. And uh, a year ago, I forget. So it was, I think it was the, at the last Sweden thing. I was talking to Erwin, and I had just been pitching the PNP to a customer because it was exactly the thing that they needed. They needed to do some stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the PNP's got this thing. And one, the, the tech guy that I was working with, he was all on board. But, like, the CTO or somebody wouldn't do it because it wasn't from Microsoft. So they wouldn't use the PNP. They didn't trust it. And I made the mistake of saying that in front of Erwin. <laughs> and, and this, I mean, this must be something that Irwin got every day about the PNP. And, of course, Irwin loves the PNP, and he's got every reason to love it and be proud of it. And he went off. And, 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 and Irwin's German, so the German language has got a lot of hard sounds and all that. And he started talking about how that was dumb and all the reasons why it was okay to use this. And that turned out to be a slide in my slide deck because I started feverishly writing everything down because he was just rapid fire. He, he, it was like an auto drive. As soon as I said that, I pulled the string and he went off. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely sanctioned. Microsoft now signs the PNP with their own c- certificate. Yep. Uh, which, which I mean, there, there's, you know, there's no higher level of trust than that. Vesa works at Microsoft. He's high up in Microsoft and he's in on board. I mean, it is a legitimate thing. I have no issues. I've, I've made some contributions. And when you watch how uh, those contributions go through the process to actually make it into a release, it, it's impressive. I mean, it goes through a bunch of testing. It goes through a, a uh, some continuous integration steps that, yeah. you know, th- this this is probably a safer pro- process than anything you're doing inside your organization, unless you're really good at what you do. So, uh, you know, I, even if I just submit a, a documentation change, one of them was, you know, like this word spelled wrong. Yeah. It went through this process that didn't slow it down, but made sure that it was okay. Yeah. So. That stuff is is very solid and very safe, and there's and, and it's really helpful. Yeah, that's that's the important part. I've got I've had many documentation things I've wanted to submit, and I've been a little I've been um, intimidated by the Git process, the pulling and pushing, and all the yeah. things. It sounds very physical, and then but I, I need to do that because there's been a couple of commandlets that my brain doesn't work the way that the person who wrote the documentation's brain does, and it took me a while to figure out how to use the commandlet because I just wasn't in it like they were. I can't believe I'm the only idiot out there, so I, I need to submit some of those things. Um, well, we can we can probably work on that together. I could teach you something because you know, yeah. GitHub GitHub is absolutely sideways or backwards. I it, you know it took me a good year, which is embarrassing to say, but I say it to make everyone else feel better. Yeah. But it took me a good year to figure out what the hell pull and push meant because to me it was not just backwards it was sort of backwards to the side yeah and and now i started using webstorm as my ide and for some reason that the way it worked with github just made it make sense to me so i've stuck with webstorm just because of that you know so everybody sort of has to get that little bit of religion it's a great way to manage content yeah code usually but documentation as well yeah yeah i need to and there's different tools and interface that i need to uh I need to get in on that. And, yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. And, and we had a question in the chat room. For, so for those of us uh, who are not, it's the whole curse of knowledge thing. The PNP that, that we're talking about is the SharePoint Patterns and Practices project on GitHub. You can go to github.com slash SharePoint slash PNP. The PNP has many tentacles. My favorite tentacle is the PowerShell commandlets, but there is other stuff that, that Mark's going to talk about here, but it's all under Patterns and Practices. The idea behind the patterns and practices was it's a project that Microsoft leads that shows non-Microsoft developers the best way to program against Microsoft things, the patterns and practices they should use when interacting with Microsoft products. Yeah, it's, it, I, I think it started out as something that came from um, Microsoft Consulting Services, yeah. and it really was patterns and practices, like, you know, yep. take this approach. Yep. It's way beyond take this approach now. It's Same. actual code that yep. we... You know, we we as developers use in our solutions, and and you would use the PowerShell, right? I use it um, every day, all the time, right? Oh, yeah, every so day. It, so it's it, the name is actually sort of misleading because it's not just patterns and practices, which is sort of advice. It's yeah. code that you can use. So anyway. much more than that now. Yeah. 
So what else is in there? So you were, we, we kind of got off on a tangent. What PMP yeah. things have come out? Uh, well, I, I, I posted in uh, Slack. There's a there's a page that has all of those open source products uh, or projects listed, which I gave I, I suggested to Vesa on Twitter today that they figure out a way to make that more obvious. I didn't know that page existed until today. Um, because there's there's good stuff, and if you can sort of scan that page, you might see more things than you newer out there. So I use some stuff all the time, and this is more dev based stuff. But you sure. could maybe you could talk about some of the other things on that page. I'll the allow P- it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah, um, PNPJS is. I, I I don't say this just to like relive my old glories, but it's sort of like SP Services for modern SharePoint. Um. It's, it's a fantastic library to uh, simplify things like REST calls and, and just interacting with the APIs in SharePoint in a, from, a, from a JavaScript perspective, but within your TypeScript solutions as well. So that, that is truly cool. Um, and then if you are building SharePoint framework solutions, there are reusable React controls and reusable property pane controls. Some of them are very similar. So those are, those are three things that I use um, now pretty much daily because why write code if it's already been done, right? And and you're using something that um, has been vetted, again, sanctioned by Microsoft. I think it's important to keep saying that. Yep. And, you know, for instance, there's a people picker in, in the React controls. You do not want to write a people picker. I do that not. Is, no. That is an awful thing. Yeah. That whoever came up with that concept and how it was built originally, ugh, but it does what you want it to do, right? Um, and so there's a there's a fantastic uh, version of the people picker in there, and I've, we've actually worked. I've worked with them a little bit on making it act more like it needs to. And so, great stuff in there. And then um, Stefan Bauer has um, the SharePoint framework um, Yeoman generator. So he's he's taking you know the Yeoman generator that Microsoft does uh, lets you start with. Um, uh, Knockout or React, and he's built out one to, that will help you with Angular and other things. He's going really far with that. So, I, I think I think the key is to go to that open source projects thing relatively regularly and just see what what kind of stuff might be there that that can help you out. Um, you know, there's the PowerShell command list that you were talking about, and a bunch of other things. So it's not all just a developer audience, right? And I think that's that's an important thing for guys like me who aren't developers. When we yes. have to write thing, we have to write things to get stuff done. What we never do, and I think what developers never do, is start in our whatever our our tool of choice is, file new and have a blank page. Like we all go somewhere and find something that's super duper close to the thing that we want to do. We start there and we just start wedging away, and you know. And I think a bunch of these projects take that a leap forward so if i wanted to write a thing which i will never do but but needs input from a user about what the person is if i were just writing it without the benefit of these things i would just have a text block and i would hope that they pasted in the right thing the right upn or whatever and then i would try to write things that caught the air but i would do a poor job and it would all explode but now i have this thing that i can just wedge in and i can use this people picker and i don't have to understand it or write it but i can get to doing the thing that i want to do which is write whatever functionality I want to use that username with. So these are great resources for developers and non-developers alike. It's it's good stuff. Again, you and I have been doing the Microsoft thing for a while, and this is so antithetical to how Microsoft was 20 years ago, and it is so good. It is such a such a great development. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 like a whole different relationship that we as a community, whether we're MVPs or not, you know, anybody can and dear Vesa on Twitter, but you know, don't do that because he's got too much of it. And and we're you know we're we're able to interact with the key people at Microsoft pretty easily, and and get good stuff out of them. And this open source stuff is a great example. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan. And I was talking to some non Microsoft IT professionals last week, and we were talking about you know there's the thing with Microsoft stock and Apple stock, and there was all a lot of discussion about that because they're big Apple fans. And they were talking about products and people's excitement about things. And they were saying that Microsoft had made some changes. And I'm like, it was all the antitrust lawsuit. Like that, that antitrust lawsuit is a huge black dividing line in Microsoft's corporate philosophy. 
and all the things that we love about Microsoft now, the Xbox and open source, all come from that point in time. When the government said, Microsoft, you're too big and you're too bad, we're splitting you up. And Microsoft went, ah. And I've read um, a couple of books about that, and it's, it's, it's interesting watching how that was just, and, and Bill Gates specifically, I was just floored about the impact that antitrust suit had on Bill Gates, the person, not just the mm. guy, not just the CEO of the company, but the man himself. And yeah. it was, uh, it was interesting to read. So yeah, we can, we can thank that. I was not a big fan of the antitrust suit. It's been 21 years now, so I don't remember all the specifics of it, but that ended up being a good thing, I think. Yeah, definitely eye opening for them about, you know, what, what being a monopoly in essence, uh, means yeah. I was most interested one of the things that I find myself constantly thinking about in life is Maslow's hierarchy of needs I don't know if you've studied no. that one of, one of my favorite concepts actually. yeah so mine too like so many things in life fit into that and yeah. when you're at Bill Gates level of success and ridiculous wealth you're at that top part of Maslow's hierarchy the self-actuation thing and He's obviously not worried about shelter. He's not worried about food. His college for his kids is, is all covered. All those things that normal guys like you and I worry about, he's got covered. And there's just no way they will not be covered. And his concern at that point, at the peak of Maslow's hierarchy, is his legacy. Like, like right. what the world. And I read one book about the, the antitrust thing that talked about how, you know, before the antitrust thing, he was at the peak of that. And he was going to be remembered by history as the man who brought the PC to the masses. He made computers in every home. He was the guy that moved the, the computer revolution that next step so that every man could, could use it. And that was going to be his legacy, and that's what he wanted. And the antitrust suit, in his mind, took that all away from him. Now he was not going to be remembered that way anymore. Now he's going to be remembered as the guy that the, the government went after because he was bad and they had right. to break up his company. And it just devastated him. It devastated him in a way that, that just you can't even imagine. And that was one of the reasons why he didn't testify at any of the antitrust hearings, because he just couldn't keep his stuff together on, on mm. the stand. He was so angry about that. And I've seen Bill Gates speak a couple of times, and obviously seen him a hundred times uh, on TV. And I don't know if you've seen him in person, but when, when he walked into the room, like he controlled the room. Like th there was nothing going on that he didn't anticipate. I mean, it was just amazing watching him. And to think about that man, that guy that I had seen, lose his stuff because he was just so angry about his legacy. And if you look back at the timeline, if you look at when the antitrust stuff started and when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation started, it's the same time. And, because, and it was all because of his legacy. It was because he realized the government had taken that one legacy. He's like, okay, I need something else. And that's, so he, you know, he, basically got out of technology at that point became wow. a, um and I, as i read that i'm like that all fits together so incredibly well yeah. that's fascinating you should you should slide some of those book titles into the uh notes i'd i'd be interested and i think a couple other people said they would be as well yeah it was uh it was yeah yeah Brett, it was it was really interesting and so they were talking about in the one book that i read uh neither balmer nor gates testified at the antitrust thing Balmer, I think we all understand that. We've all seen the, the monkey boy and the developer, developer, developer. Like, <laughs> like you, you, you understand that, right? He's just enthusiastic and he's just... Right. Gates was always so measured and so in control of every situation he was in. I just could not imagine. But it, but it shook him to the core that bad that he just could not... Wow. I never thought about that. Hmm. Um, but that's where we got all this open source stuff. That's it all Interesting. That. Well, I think... I also think uh, that, that I'm, I'm not debating that that's true i think that that may have laid some foundation way back sure but but i also think that the one microsoft initiative that actually was started by Balmer, but then satya took up and and really uh has has run with has that to me is when we started to see the impact i mean it, it's not that there, the changes were probably going on internally for a long time but yeah. i think when when satya came into into play, uh, the ethos of the whole company really changed. And, and yeah. you and I, having gone out there to Seattle for the uh, the uh, MVP summit, you know, we actually, I mean, I, I remember noticing it just walking down the hallway. People were different. Yeah. It, and it happened very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, all, it, and I, I think a lot of the people at Microsoft were actually um, 
they they were sort of sort of squished underneath a culture that they didn't really feel comfortable in, and now they're now they're a, a able to do the things that they would have always wanted to do. I I think they were discouraged from having social media accounts, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. and then look at what they're doing now. I mean, if you if you want to know something about what's going on in, in this community, they're all out there. Yeah. So things have changed a lot. And and, I, and I'm with you because I think most of the people that I deal with at Microsoft. Are as excited about technology as we are. It, sure. and they, they want it. They want to spread it. They want it. But I, I agree with you. You know, 15 years ago, that was not encouraged. And it was. It's that. And I love that old cartoon. I think it was an XKCD thing with the different company hierarchies. And the one from Microsoft was all the different business right. units with guns like pointed guns. at each other. <laughs> yeah. It, it very much felt that way. I mean, you. That was absolutely correct. And it was such a tight. You know. I don't, I don't think it's that way anymore. And it's, yeah, you can, you can feel it. The, the people are able to work with their excitement. And yeah, I mean, it's still a very big company and they have big company politics and, you know, you and I run into that stuff too, but yeah. uh, it, it seems like it's surmountable now. You know, you, you talk to somebody like Dan Holm and, or, or Vesa and they, they, they figure out how to navigate that company to get something done as opposed to saying, well, we can't do that because so-and-so is angry at us, you know, which is the way it used to work. We have run very long, so let's hit the uh, community corner and the promotion stuff. You added a couple of things in there. Would you like to talk about the first sure. thing in the community there? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how many of your listeners are, com are familiar with the Collab 365 community, but if you go to, I think it's collab365.org. Sorry, I'm just going to check. Uh, or, or .com. Well, while that spins, They're, they've done some uh, virtual uh, conferences in the past. You know, they, the thing that I, I got to know them uh, w with first was a 24-hour round-the-world conference that they did. Uh, I don't know, probably, what, three, four years ago? Oh, I think it was longer than that. I think they did that. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's actually collab365.community. Is their is their website? So they've been doing um, community based stuff. A guy named Mark Jones runs this thing, and uh, I mean, if you haven't dug into this this community, there's all kinds of stuff in there, and uh, micro jobs is one of those things. And so under the sort of micro jobs banner, and I'll let you figure out what's going on in in all of this without talking about all the details. But they're going to start uh, virtual. Um, uh, conferences based around certain topics under the micro jobs banner. So oh. uh, I saw Mark taking in a poll of you know what to call call things and you know so they're sort of starting to think of revving that up and it'll be a monthly thing with different topics every month. So you might want to keep an eye out uh, for a topic that's relevant or interesting to you. Yeah, uh, one of the fun things. So they uh, if you go to collab three sixty five dot community, they have an aggregator of different blogs and things like that and they've got my blog in there and i've had to work with mark a couple of times on taking the crappy rss feed the sharepoint 2010 uh, <laughs> vomits out and sucking it into his thing so he can make heads or tails of it in his uh right yeah and, I, and as i look now i don't see my thing i don't know if it's just you know aged out but uh, I know it's been a source of much frustration for Mark, and I feel bad about that. Oh, it's good that you're able to torture people from afar. <laughs> With my sh swinging my SharePoint 2010 all over. <laughs> um, yeah, so I agree. Collab 365, they've been very active in the community for a lot of years, and I, yeah, they're good people. I like them. Uh, for events, kind of the same stuff we've had going on. You and I and Julie and the gang are going to be in Austin here in a month uh, at SB TechCon. So you can get sbtechcon.com and see all about that. I'm going to be doing a thing with Shane and another thing with Shane. And I forget what all stuff we're going to be doing. But go out there. If you haven't signed up for that one, that's a good one. Nice little friendly conference in Austin. It'll be a nice break from the weather here in Iowa. Good music, good barbecue. Yep, yep. All that good stuff. I will be in Kansas City on March 11th speaking at the user group down there. I think that's a Monday, and that's close enough. I'm going to drive down, and the, the user group thing is at noon. So if you're in the Kansas City area want to hang out with me for lunch on Monday, March 11th, go ahead and head down there. I'll be doing that. Uh, and then a couple of days later, I'm going to be going to Branson, Missouri for the North American Collaboration Summit. That is March 14th to the 15th, and Lori will be there, and I'll be there, and Shane will be there, and it will be uh, – all kinds of crazy stuff there. Great conference. 
Uh, and then at the end of March, I'll be doing SharePoint Saturday in Omaha on March 30th. So you can sign up for that. I forget what I'm talking about there. but that's You're all it. over the Midwest, though. But, man. Well, yes, March is a very busy month for me doing that. And then it looks like we're going to maybe try to do the Sweden thing again this year. Um, I was looking at my calendar. I'm like, I'm going to be in Omaha on March 30th. Oh, yeah, that's tricky. home on April 1st. Huh. Uh, so that's the, the SharePoint Exchange Forum Joran Huseman puts on. Man, I look forward to my trips to Sweden all the time. What a great place. What a great, what a great country, great people, great community. Just can't get enough of that. Yeah, if anybody, if anybody is from anywhere near that part of the world, they really ought to sign up for that one. It's a great, it's, it's a great value, too. It's not expensive compared to a lot of the big conferences. And it's, yeah, and it's another one of those that is a, a, a cozy one. So there's, you know, you get a lot of attention from the speakers and the other people. And it's, I, I love that one, just getting to talk to folks. I'm a, I'm a pretty friendly guy, so I like those small, intimate ones because I can really chat with folks. And it's, uh, it's where you and I go to talk to each other. We do. We see each other in Sweden. It's a good time. <laughs> So, uh, and then the SharePoint conference in Vegas, May 21st through the 23rd. That's that's the big dog. There's uh, a lot going on there. I know I'm doing an all day session ahead of time. I think you're you and Julie are doing some stuff too. No, uh, I have one session. Julie's got two or maybe three. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll be there in force. Excellent. Yeah, good good times for that at the MGM Grand. And then you're going to be in Wiesbaden, are you Wiesbaden. not? Wiesbaden. Yeah, yeah that, so that, that conference, the European Collaboration Summit, follows right on the heels of the SharePoint conference, and it's in Germany. So it's not that it's the same thing that Microsoft does in, in uh, Vegas, but I think a lot, of the, a lot of the sessions, a lot of the speakers, you know, we sort of go from the SharePoint conference over to Germany and deliver some of the same content which sounds lazy, but it's actually a good thing because it's a totally different audience. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's a great conference. If you're in, if you're in Europe, that's a, it's actually a community based conference. Maybe it should be in the community corner. Don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to sort this stuff. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's cheap. I mean, if, if you're in Europe, I think I'm going to get it wrong, but it's not, it's not more than a hundred Euro. I don't think. Um, so it, it, it's world-class stuff for very little money. Yeah, and it's 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 the big dogs in the community over there. It's Otis and Tony and and Spence and Fitz and all those guys are getting that. Uh, and they let me stand in the corner. So very nice, yeah. And I I thought about that's one that I've never gone to. Uh, I'd like to do it. And I, if if it weren't right on the heels of SharePoint conference, and if I didn't have so much other stuff going on, I might uh, might try that one. But I need to get to that one. It's a, it's a good. Yeah, one. yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm sorry that so that, that, I, just to get the cost right, it's now up to 250 euros because it goes up as you yeah. get close to the organization or to the to the conference. But it's still a lot cheaper than any big conference. Yeah, good good value. Well, That's we have gone cheap. long as as often the case. We're having so much fun. Yeah, it's uh, it's time flies. So thanks everybody. Uh, chat room. I'm gonna stick around for a while. Uh, chat with you guys. But thanks for coming in, Mark. I, I you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that Shane's busy next week. Maybe just between you and I. <laughs> yeah, why don't we tell him that? So, tell him, tell him there's something going on in that closet over there, right? Yeah, we're, we're uh, yeah. hey Shane, yep. we're gonna do the podcast on Thursday this week. Yeah. So if you want to show yeah. up Thursday morning. Might, uh, might do that. <laughs> but thanks for giving me an hour of your time today, Mark. Uh, I yeah, appreciate you it. do it. Always fun to actually be able to chat with each other because mm -hmm. you know we live far apart. We do. Uh, and thanks everybody, and we will uh, we'll see you next week.